Okay, in this lecture today, we're going to cover linear combination of atomic orbitals for quantum mechanically solving the Schrodinger equation for molecules. We'll talk about combining these atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals, what basis functions are, and look at the simplest molecule we can, H2+. Now, last lecture, we talked about the Schrodinger equation for molecules and what it looked like. We talked about employing the Born-Oppenheimer approximation to solve Schrodinger's equation, separating out the electronic and nuclear terms because the electrons are really light. The nuclei are essentially fixed. The electrons are moving really fast. They're light. So the nuclei are fixed, and you can assume there's this fixed nuclear distance that's not changing while the electrons are free to roam. Solve the Schrodinger equation for the electronic part, then update and change your nuclear part and resolve the electronic part. In doing so, you're, you're solving this overall Hamiltonian. Again, where the wave functions here are the molecular orbitals themselves, right? So these eigenfunctions that we're solving for the molecule are the molecular orbitals. And yes, we've broken this full Hamiltonian for the molecule apart into the electronic part and the nuclear part using the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And we're really just now talking about the electronic part where these wave functions here are the molecular orbitals. This is still really hard to solve, right? Even though we have the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, this Hamiltonian is still many, many terms long. You have the kinetic energy of the electrons. You have the electron attraction to atom A and atom B and atom C. Then you have the electron-electron repulsion between electron one and two, electron one and three, electron one and four, electron two and five, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's actually a lot easier to just use your chemical intuition and intelligence to guess what the solutions look like and then find the functions that describe those visual solutions. So let's think about the simplest molecule we can, hydrogen. And let's make it even simpler by adding, or should say removing, an electron. So this is still a one electron system. What does this nucleus look, or what does this molecule look like? Well, here's proton A, hydrogen A. Here's hydrogen B. And here's the single electron between them. Now, I'm drawing this as a single particle. We know in quantum mechanics, this electron is really a negative charged sphere that's sort of spread out, but where does it want to be, right? It's delocalized over both. But first, let's think about this as two maybe separate systems here. Here's system one. And here's system two. And so system two here is basically an atom, right? there's going to be some atomic orbital for atom B. One electron, one proton, that's just the hydrogen atom. I know the solutions to the hydrogen atom. So there's my wave function that we've solved in previous lectures for where the electron wants to be in that atom. Likewise, I have the same thing for atom A. Right? I'm separating this molecular orbital into two separate atomic orbitals by separating the molecule into two sort of sub-atoms. Right? So I have atomic orbital A on the left plus atomic orbital B. The exact functions, well, I've solved those before for Schrodinger equation for this exactly solvable atom. It looks like this, phi of A. And so I can add these two atomic orbitals together and those will be the solution here. That's my guess, right? That the wave function that satisfies this electronic part of the Hamiltonian for a molecule can be thought of as this summed contribution of the two atomic orbitals. That is to say, a molecular orbital is a linear combination 
of two atomic orbitals. Linear because you're just adding them. Atom A plus atom B, a linear combination of these two atomic orbitals. So it's a mouthful, but that's all it means. Now, really what I want to describe here is not complete. The wave function, that is the solution to Schrodinger's equation for a molecule, is not just the atomic orbital A plus the atomic orbital B, but I have much more flexibility if I use weighting coefficients. So think back to this quantum mechanical superposition principle, right, where we talked about a given quantum system might be a superposition of various states. So I'm making an eigenfunction here that itself is a combination of eigenfunctions weighted with different weighting terms. So here's a weighting coefficient for A, and here's a weighting coefficient for B. So I can take these two atomic systems, linearly combine them, weight them differently, and this is a superposition that describes the overall quantum system. And the solution is a molecular orbital. It's a superposition of these two atomic orbitals where each atomic orbital has a certain weight, weighting coefficient, which describes, in a pictorial sense, how much does this overall molecular orbital look like atomic orbital A? How much does it look like B? Right? If weighting coefficient is 1 and 0, well, then it's basically just this atom, and the solution will just be that atomic orbital. Right? But in a real sense, that's probably not what it's going to be like. Unless perhaps atom A and atom B are infinitely far apart, and the electron is just near A. Okay, so the C terms here are the weighting coefficients. Here, this is the molecular orbital for this molecule I'm thinking about. So, linear combination of atomic orbitals here, LCAO, is an approximation. It's sort of a guess and check. That's use what is analytically solvable for atoms and think about combining these things linearly. Maybe those will be good solutions for my molecular orbital. Schrodinger equation is hard to solve. We separated the electronic and nuclear parts with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Now we have a second approximation here. The approximation says you can linearly combine atomic orbitals to get the molecular orbital. And so doing this, our strategy is going to be the following. Try different values of weighting coefficient. Solve for your eigenenergies. Then change the weighting coefficient, coefficients and resolve. Right, so this molecular orbital literally is just weighting coefficients times the atomic orbitals. These themselves are functions, and we have those functions written out in spherical coordinates, right? We talked about them being a function of r, theta, and phi in different quantum numbers. And we're just going to weight them differently, add them together, put them in this Schrodinger equation, and get our energies. Then we're going to come back and change CA. Maybe it's not 100 and 0. Maybe it's 60, 40. Maybe it's 50, 50. And we're going to resolve them. And we just keep doing this till we optimize CA and CB to give the lowest energy. Once you've done that, Well, you've just done that for one value of the distance between them. Now you change the distance and you resolve. Okay, so this is still part of, if you go back to the previous lecture, solving an individual electronic energy that you combine with the nuclear energy for a given nuclear distance between these. Here for hydrogen, it's the difference between these two single protons. 
Here I'm writing it more generally, just the distance between these two. Okay, so the weighting coefficients might be different if the atoms themselves are different. Okay, so if something is symmetric like this, it's both hydrogen, it's probably going to be equally wanted by each atom, right? But if it's oxygen and hydrogen, well, one of those elements is more electronegative, one of those has a lot more protons, maybe there is more of a localization and a heavier, heavier weighting coefficient on that more electronegative atom. Okay, so the weighting coefficients, a lot of times you can have some chemical intuition to what they are. Here, they're probably going to be about even. Because, well, they're both identical hydrogen atoms. Okay, so in computational chemistry, the atomic orbitals here, right, that I'm talking about, phi of A and phi of B, they are the basic functions that we're using to build our molecular orbitals. And in computational chemistry, these are called basis functions. Right, and a group of them is a basis set. And so that's the terminology you'll see a lot in computational chemistry. A basis set is a set of these individual functions. The functions are the atomic orbitals, right? These are mathematical functions. We call them basis functions. A set of these that I'm going to linearly combine that's my basis set. So a basis set in computational chemistry is all the different sort of atomic orbitals that you're linearly combining. And you're guessing weighting coefficients for that basis set, keeping in mind that the weighting coefficients C1, C2, C3, etc. must all sum to 1. Right, because the electron has to be somewhere. The probability of finding the electron somewhere must sum to 1, and it's the square of the wave functions that matters for probability, so this is the identity that must be followed. Okay, so that's what we're doing here with linear combination of atomic orbitals applied to this Born-Oppenheimer approximation separated nuclear and electronic terms. Now, let's look at this more quantitatively and pictorially for my molecule, H2+. Here's my distance between the two. Now we're connecting this back to our large Hamiltonian in the previous lecture and identifying what each of the terms were. And so the electronic Hamiltonian here, actually we'll do the full Hamiltonian here. There's four different groups of terms, negative h bar squared over 2me. This is the kinetic energy operator, has to do with derivative terms based on r, theta, and phi in spherical coordinates. You would sum these up for all the electrons. There's only one electron here, so there's only one of these kinetic terms. This is the kinetic energy of that single electron. I then have the term that represents the attraction of said electron, the nucleus A. Z A here is one, it's a proton, it's hydrogen. Four pi epsilon naught, the distance from that electron to atom A. But I also need the distance from that electron to atom B. Again, Z here is one for both atoms because they're both hydrogen, which has one proton. The last term here is the nuclear repulsion between atoms A and B. All right, so if you're thinking about the full Hamiltonian of a molecule, you have a kinetic energy of the electrons term, you have a 
attraction. From the electron to a nucleus. There's only one electron, so there's only two terms. There's no summation here because there's just one electron. So there's specifically each term. Then you have the nuclear nuclear repulsion. And we're missing one term from our overall description of what the Hamiltonian should look like. That term we're missing is the repulsion between multiple electrons. Right? But we don't have multiple electrons here, so we don't have to worry about that. It's a one electron system. Okay? Again, my R, A of B is constant. So these are all just a bunch of constants. I could take that and separate out the nuclear term and just solve the Hamiltonian for these three, or just solve the Schrodinger equation based on these first three terms. Further, I can think about this term or these two terms here in the following way. And there's this nice trick, right? I've rewritten this now. Just factoring out the charge on the electron and 4 pi epsilon naught. This are two, these are two different distances, right? But just like we've done in past lectures with two different masses, we replaced it with a reduced mass. You can replace two different distances with a single distance. And sort of reduced coordinates. Okay, we're not going to do that, but I make the point here because if this is a constant, I'm solving just based on the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, the nuclei not moving. If that is a constant, okay, if these are all constants, and I can replace this with one single distance, this one electron molecule is exactly solvable. And this is great. Okay, it's great, and Schrodinger did this back in the 20s and 30s. You can use pen and paper to exactly solve this. Okay, so not only can we solve Schrodinger's equation for one electron atoms, we can solve it for one electron molecules. And it's a good thing because what we're going to do is use linear combination of atomic orbitals to figure out what the solutions might be guessed to be, and then check versus the actual solved ones and make sure they match. And that gives us some faith moving forward that we can use linear combination of atomic orbitals for molecules with more than one electron because we know it works for this one electron system. So this is a one electron system, it's exactly solvable. And more specifically, it's just the electronic part that is exactly solvable here, since we're assuming this nuclear distance is fixed. Okay, so let's assume this is not exactly solvable, and we're gonna use the linear combination of atomic orbitals approach. Let's think about what that might look like pictorially. Okay, so let's think about this graph, right? In this graph, I'm gonna show the potentials of two atoms. Okay, this is my sort of particle in a box, more in spherical coordinates, and this is atom A, this is hydrogen A, we'll call it. Right, and somewhere over here, I have an identical potential. Pretend like these lines are identical, even though they're drawn quite terribly. This is hydrogen B. And I know in this particle in a box model, there are quantized energy levels. Maybe there's a level, maybe there's a level up here. I'm just gonna draw one here so that I can draw things more clearly. Okay, those are my two eigenstates in the different atoms. And here, is the distance between them a b okay so i'm using linear combination of atomic orbitals for a given distance between the nuclei and using linear combination of atomic orbitals we're going to assume this one electron if this is really far apart is just localized on a single atom so this is a very large distance very large radius between the two atoms so consider hydrogen a and hydrogen b infinitely far apart 
Whereas the electron, it's not distributed over both, it's only distributed over one atom. Okay, so the wave function here would look like what? Well, it looks like the exact wave function. For just the hydrogen atom. And this wave function we've talked about in lectures before, it looks like this. This is what we've been referring to my hydrogen atom A wave function for my atomic orbital. Okay, that's the picture. It's just the atomic orbital, the 1s orbital on hydrogen A. There is no density on hydrogen B. The molecular orbital overall is just 1 times hydrogen A plus 0 times hydrogen B. And this will match exactly the analytical solution to Schrodinger equations at large distances of the radius. But now let's look at what happens when I move these two atoms closer together. When I move these two atoms closer together, now the potential merge. Okay, and now the state, right? Think of the box, a particle in a box. We'll think of the box now as being larger. What's our linear combination of atomic orbitals approach say? Well, let's think about this as two different atomic orbitals. Okay, and to go back, why did I draw the wave function like this? Right, this is the 1s function, if you think back. What does the 1s orbital look like? In terms of the radial part of the function, it looks like this, just a decaying exponential. But now I'm showing this in sort of two dimensions, left and right. So I'm just taking this and rotating it around this y-axis here. That's how I come up with this shape. Right, if it's the 2s orbital, it looks more like this. Right, and if it's the 2p orbital, I would have drawn this shape. Right, but I know the ground state here is going to be the 1s shape. It looks like this, wrapped around in two directions. Looks like that chevron shape I have drawn. So, now let's draw those two, now that it's merged. I'm going to draw the two atomic orbitals, so I'm not going to worry about, even though this is hydrogen A on the left and hydrogen B, I'm just going to draw it for hydrogen A. What does it look like? Well, I guess it looks like this. And for hydrogen B, it looks similar. It's just centered on hydrogen B. There's my atomic orbital HB. Here's my atomic orbital HA that I've drawn. Right, and my molecular orbital overall. again, is this weighted contribution of these two atomic orbitals. And if they're identical atoms like they are here, then CA equals CB. And so now to get the overall molecular orbital, we're just going to add these two things together, right? And we're going to pictorially draw this together. You can see they overlap. I've sort of exaggerated here, right? If I move these atoms closer together, the amount of overlap right here would be greater. And so let's draw this now in a combined fashion, maybe closer together. So I'm sort of narrowing up the potentials here. And overall, then the molecular orbital would look like this. Well, not quite. You still get this side being the same. You still get this side being the same. But instead of going down to zero here, there's a dip and it comes back up. And now this is the molecular orbital. Right, and you can think about the atomic orbital that was used to draw this. Well, it looks like this. And it looks like this. 
but the molecular orbital here is a bit higher here because it's this atomic orbital plus a little bit of the decaying one from this atom. And so those two things sum together. Give me what I like to call this Batman shape. Here. Like the top of his mask. Right? So this is now the molecular orbital and what it looks like. Okay, and this wave function here for the molecular orbital that I've just gotten by combining these two atomic orbitals in equal parts shows the electron delocalized over both atoms. So this is still a single electron. Right? This is still a single electron, but now it has access to both hydrogen A and hydrogen B. And think of it as the box length getting longer. We now have this wave function that's delocalized over both atoms. That's actually going to lower the energy and make it more stable because the box length is longer. Right? So, solving the Schrodinger equation exactly, going back and solving uh, this whole thing exactly gives us the same type of function. But there's one thing I'm ignoring. The one thing I'm ignoring here is that CA equals CB. And it will. But it's actually plus or minus CB. Right? Because the observables are always equal to the square. So all we really know for sure is CA squared equals CB squared. Which means CA is equal to CB or it's equal to the opposite of CB. So while this is one molecular orbital that I can have, there's another evil side to this situation. And the evil side to this situation looks like this. Imagine we're taking this and my first wave function again looks like this. But now my second wave function is negative, and so it looks like this. Opposite of the red function. So now what happens when I add these, assuming CA is the opposite of CB? All right, so up here, I should say CA is exactly equal to CB. Down here, CA is equal to the opposite of CB. And now I get a function that when I add these two together, looks like the following. And this right here is a node, a region where the wave function that is the electron in this molecule can never be. Okay, so now we're combining ato atomic orbitals with opposite signs. Again, this is possible because the observations of electrons are based on wave function squared, not the wave functions themselves. So this is all we know for sure, is that if the atoms are the same, the weighting coefficients squared are the same, but there's two possibilities. CA equals plus CB, so the same sign, which is shown here, or opposite sign. We call this bonding, and we call this bottom one antibonding. And so for every combination of atomic orbitals, there are two cases where they combine in a bonding fashion and where they combine in an anti-bonding fashion. Okay, so that'll do it for this lecture on linear combination of atomic orbitals. Right? We've covered this Schrodinger equation applied to H2+, using this linear combination of atomic orbitals approach. We talked about how it's solvable, but we can guess what the answers are using our atomic orbital wave functions. We showed that there's really two possibilities for any linear combination of atomic orbitals. One of the same sign leads to bonding, and one of opposite sign leads to antibonding.
The next lecture will build this out a little bit more and come up with terms like garad and ungarad. We'll talk about molecular orbitals in the sense of being sigma and pi molecular orbitals and building full molecular orbital diagrams where we talk about how many electrons does it take to make a stable molecule versus an unstable molecule and also cover diatomics and heteronuclear diatomics and how the molecular orbital pictures change. So that's it for today's lecture. Feel free to subscribe or like this video on YouTube. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.